an mm -hmm. overall picture. That's absolutely essential. That's largely uh, a resource and skill set uh, question. And then it is very important that we take uh, the general public with us, whose data this is at the end of the day, uh, to make sure that they feel comfortable that the way that we've brought data together to support decisions, to support medical uh, science, uh, is, in, is in line with what they would be expecting uh, from their own data. And I think those two have to be kept in balance. But occasionally, I think we have allowed ourselves to get overly concerned uh, with the risks of this and therefore not make for, not actually bring together data that would be hugely in the public interest to bring together, uh, both to allow us to provide services now and to provide science that will improve uh, public health and medicine in the future. A second, perhaps even more important aspect of your technical report, because it comes in Chapter 2, is the issue of disparities. Why are disparities in health relevant to the issue of preparedness? The evidence, Sir Christopher, shows that the government systems on preparedness and the policy and the guidance and the, the structures paid absolutely no regard to disparities in health, other than insofar as there was an obvious reflection of the fact that clinically, some sectors of the population, because of comorbidities, would be worse off in the event of a pandemic. Your report focuses to a very large extent on the need to ensure that disparities in health and in society are addressed. Why must they be addressed in the context of preparedness? One of the things that is uh, striking and repeated in every pandemic and epidemic is that uh, people living in uh, areas of disparity uh, suffer cr most from them. The reasons for that, however, vary. So, you know, the reasons that people in cholera epidemics died in higher numbers is because of the provision of poor water. The reason that people in uh, some of the uh, respiratory uh, pandemics of his, his history uh, died was because they were in crowded uh, housing conditions and so on. And I'm making that point because uh, you, you both need to think about disparity as a whole, but you also need to think about what the causal pathway is for each route of transmission and for each pandemic as it goes through. But I think there's the one final point I would like to make, which is the best way you can deal with reducing the risk of a pandemic to people living in areas of disparity or living with particular risks is to, re is to get on top of the pandemic. Essentially, that is the most sure way of doing so. Uh, and I think we have to always remember that that's the central plank on, on which everything else is, is based. Finally, um, in a in a particularly uh, self-deprecating manner, uh, Sir Oliver Letwin s stated uh, in evidence that politicians were in some significant regards amateurs, and that there was a, a case for training of ministers and officials in crisis management. Is there anything that you'd like to say on that topic? Uh, I, I would absolutely not want to venture to suggest any particular training for our political leaders. I think it, much of what they bring is the ability to ask questions which, uh, in a sense, people bring because they're new to a field. I think one of the dangers in all areas of expertise is you become snowblind. You don't realise the obvious question. And actually, having political leaders who come in from outside is one of the ways in which they can produce radicalism. And I think Sir Oliver, sparing his blushes as he's not here, was a very good example of that. He did, an, in my view, a superb job, for example, during the West African Ebola crisis uh, in knitting things together, uh, absolutely picked up o o on all the issues. I think, however, what is helpful uh, is for people to realize the range of capabilities they have at their disposal. And uh, therefore, whilst I, I, you know, whilst that's entirely optional for certainly political leaders, that's their choice, I do think within government, uh, there's sometimes a, a lack of understanding of science between emergencies. And this goes back to this between emergency and in an emergency. In an emergency, everybody is clamoring for science advice. I've seen this in every emergency I've ever seen. They are desperate to get the scientists in the room. Between emergencies, you have to kind of elbow your way in. Uh, and so it's the ability to actually engage all the way through the system between emergencies that I think is the big risk. 
people can pick things up very quickly when they need to. A very large proportion of the British population now know a lot more epidemiology than many doctors probably did th three years ago. So it's a, you know, it, people, can, people can pick stuff up very quickly when they need to. What I think they need to do is think about the range of issues between emergencies which may, in due course, uh, lead us into problems. Between emergencies, Sir Christopher, you are sadly prophets in your own land. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Thank you very much. Milady, there are a number of questions under Rule 10. From COVID-19 bereaved families for justice groups. Thank you. Ms. Monroe. Thank you, my lady. Good afternoon, Sir Christopher. Um, my name is Alison Munro, and I ask questions this afternoon on behalf of COVID Breeze Families for Justice. Before um, the questions arise out of a guidance document that you may or may not um, be familiar with, Sir Mark Walport provided the inquiry with a draft guidance for SAGE on emerging infections diseases, which was produced between 2013 and 2017. Um, perhaps if we could bring that guidance up, please. It's INQ 00142139. Thank you. And if we go to page two, we can see the, the contents of the document. And then at page three, <coughs> Thank you. At page three, the purpose. So this document is intended to assist the government chief scientific advisor and the scientific advisory group for emergency, SAGE, to provide timely, relevant scientific advice to the cabinet office briefing rooms, COBRA, in the event of an emergency involving a non-influenza emerging or unidentified infectious disease which might affect the UK. Now, I don't need to take you through the rest of that document um, for the purposes of the questions, but suffice to say, Sir Christopher, within that document there are definitions of risk, um, definitions of emergent infectious diseases, and at pages for reference six, seven, and eight, the guidance sets out key issues in terms of the impact or potential impact of um, emergent diseases on public, on civil society, and on the economy. First question, um, Sir Christopher, rather long introduction. Uh, did you know about this guidance at the time um, that we're concerned with in this inquiry? Uh, I didn't uh, recall this guidance uh, during the ch short period between becoming CMO and uh, the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, but I suspect I may well have contributed in, a very, in several previous iterations of my role to the development of this draft guidance. I recognise kind of phrases I probably would have put into it, so I think I am aware broadly uh, but it's a while since I've seen uh, anything like this, and it's not, uh, I certainly hadn't seen the final version. In fact, I'm not sure there has been a final version of this. Yes, because it's the authorship and the date of the, the document, I've said between 2013 and 2017. So as you said, there are a number of different versions of it, perhaps, iterations of it. So there were, two, there were two sorts of document, if I can just clarify. There were Please. documents like this which were to help guide the SAGE process and make it rapidly respond to a problem. And then when I was uh, in, an interim, just interim, government chief standing advisor between Sir Mark Warport, who you heard from uh, yesterday, and Sir Patrick Vance, who you'll hear from subsequently, I helped to... Um, <coughs> Uh, add to that something we call golden hour documents, which were documents which allowed someone to deal with the, the bones of a problem even before SAGE had met, where you actually look at the key issues scientifically uh, so you can actually uh, inform discussions with ministers. Yes, because in the guidance, and again, we don't need to take you to the um, document or have it up on the screen, but pages 8, 9 and 10 set out a series of questions for COBRA and certain responses or advice that um, could and should be given. Um, are you able to tell us then, uh, Sir Christopher, um, in terms of this particular guidance, 
um, how would it have been used by yourself and what considerations to this guidance would you have given, particularly um, in terms of informing any pandemic planning and educating frontline workers in health or social care, for example? So this document, to be clear, had a pretty narrow specific purpose, and this was to help uh, guide the setup for a SAGE were there to be an emergency in this situation. So it was not designed for frontline workers. It wasn't in fact designed to have a wider utility. This kind of document was very narrowly to help the Government Office of Science to have the most focused and effective first few SAGE meetings. This would be particularly important if the Government Chief Scientific Advisor, for example, was working in an area outside his or her own field of expertise. I think the more they're in their area of expertise, the more they would have felt comfortable, in a sense, setting the agenda themselves. But as a guidance document, by, as its name suggests, it, it provides you with some advice and perhaps it, almost a starting point for further discussion, further thinking. Exactly. It's designed as guidance, but guidance to guide the SAGE meeting, yeah. not guidance for the wider uh, generality. You've mentioned the golden hour documents. Um, again, turning back to Sir Mark Walport, um, who said of this draft guidance that it morphed into the current set of golden hour documents used by Go Science. Um, firstly, can you just explain what, what, what that is when, when, when you talk about it and when Sir, Sir Mark talks about the golden hour documents? So uh, the, the, the slightly clumsy phrasing actually unfortunately is from me because okay. I'm, it comes from sort of classic medical emergency uh, procedures where you say you, there's a golden hour in which you can intervene very rapidly and in that time you can have a very big impact. And the, the, the lacuna, the gap that I perceived and others perceived was there was a period between the point an emergency arose and a point a SAGE had met when a government chief scientific advisor, a departmental chief scientific advisor, CMO or whatever, would be asked legitimate and important questions by political leaders and others to which they would have to give answers at that time but in advance of the SAGE. So the idea of it was to give basically a kind of crash course in a subject, let us say a major earthquake, so that someone could actually go to their first meetings with some degree uh, of confidence that they had the various areas covered. Thank you. And I think you've in that answer, you've answered my next question, which was, how was this, these golden hour documents used within your specific role as chief medical officer? Is there anything else that you want to say about that and how you would use it? No, except I think to pay tribute to the, um, the SAGE secret secretariat from Go Science, who not only managed the SAGE meetings, but essentially provided the horizon scanning and the uh, apparatus that underpins what the government chief scientific advisor can do in an emergency, particularly in the earliest stages. Thank you. Um, so, Christopher, my next question is about emerging infectious diseases. Um, am I correct in saying that high consequence infectious diseases fall within the emerging infectious disease category on the National Risk Register? So, for example, Ebola, SARS, MERS, avian flu are all examples of um, high consequence infectious diseases, HCIDs. Uh, some um, high consequence infect infectious diseases are, are emerging diseases, uh, a few are not, uh, and many emerging diseases are not high consequence infectious diseases. So they're not synonymous, but there is a lot of overlap uh, in some of the more severe ones, uh, the ones uh, like the ones you mentioned. So my question is this to Christopher. Um, in the guidance, and this is at page five, it says that um, an emerging infectious disease could potentially become pandemic. And that must be correct, mustn't it? Very rarely. Very rarely. The author then goes on, or authors rather, go on at page six of the guidance um, to outline, firstly, the most likely scenario and then the worst, reasonable worst case scenario. Um, if we could perhaps have the document back up and go to page six to look at what's actually said there. So just looking at that box at the top of page six, Sir Christopher, um, 
Are you familiar with what's written there? I am. Yeah. So they're starting, again, it's a starting point for thinking and discussion in this document, looking at scenarios um, and what potential action could potentially be taken, um, and also looking at behavioural aspects as well. Um, so you would accept, would you not, that um, in relation to emerging infectious diseases such as SARS, um, or a SARS-like disease, that was the most likely scenario? Within the uh, narrow, narrowish definition of emerging infectious diseases that were important enough that they could have an impact on the UK, that's a lot of caveats, because <laughs> uh, in that environment, something like SARS would be a very good example. But if I can just to explain why I've made that distinction, uh, another emerging infectious disease of signif very considerable significance was Zika virus. We considered this roughly over this time period. Uh, we thought this was a very serious emerging infectious disease, but because the mosquito species that could pass this on are not able to maintain themselves mm. for long periods in the UK, at least at this point uh, uh, in time, we thought this was a significant risk globally, in this particular case in Brazil, and this was in an Olympic year, but it was not a significant risk in the UK, nor was it likely to become so. And it is quite important when you look at a risk or a hazard that you make a judgment, is this a risk or a hazard in one place, or is this a risk or a hazard that's likely to come to the UK? This was an example where actually the risk or the risk in this case uh, was going not likely to come to the UK. And we made an important professional judgment. We did not need to go beyond a certain point in our planning on this, because that would be inappropriate given the relatively low risk, in fact, almost zero risk of a significant epidemic of this infection in the UK. Right. Well, m my final question is about um, the, where the emphasis lay um, in UK planning. Um, and just to put this in context, um, with HCIDs, um, there would need to be, in terms of the response, an enhanced response. There needs to be quite a specific response, which uh, notice, use, is based on the fact that these infections can have a very significant mortality if someone catches them, high, high, in terms of high numbers. And in your evidence earlier this afternoon, it was just after half 12, I think, um, you were discussing the, long, the long-standing bias for pandemic flu planning. Um, and you said, I think that's true. Having documents and plans are separate things. You need to have capabilities backed up by resources with capabilities to scale up. Um, now, with HCIDs, and I think this, again, uh, hopefully you'll, ex you'll agree with this, um, in terms of airborne HCIDs and the resp responding to them, there have been some exercises, such as an Ebola exercise, wasn't there? Yes, I mean, Ebola, just to be clear, is actually a touch-based disease. It's not airborne or... Uh, respiratory by route. That's an important point. So were I sitting next to someone who had Ebola, I'd be much less concerned than if it was an airborne or, or respiratory infection. Well, as a HCID, perhaps. It is an then. HCID, yeah. um, So there was a, 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 an Ebola preparedness surge capacity exercise, wasn't there? Uh, I, I, if you tell me so, I'm sure that is true. I can't recall it, but I'm sure that is true. Um, again, again, we don't need to bring it up, but for reference, it is in the documents at INQ. Four zeros nine oh four two eight, um, and the outcome of that surge capacity exercise for this HCID um, showed that there wasn't, in fact, capacity to surge. It was a small an amount of five cases, which would result in the loss of eighty infectious beds. So even on a small scale, um, for HCIDs, it's going to be di it was going to be difficult, wasn't it? To so scale up and so the, the way that i would conceptualize this if i if i may is that you have uh, two extremely specialist centers in the uk uh, one in london one in newcastle uh, which can manage the most infectious and dangerous cases including diseases we may never have uh, come across before 
around that, there's a larger group of uh, centres that are specialist in uh, HCIDs, which are, in a sense, still dealing with very high-risk infections, but a slightly lower level of risk. But if you ran out of beds with the first two, then you would move into the next area around. Then around that are a group of specialist infectious disease what's called negative pressure rooms, where the air is sucked into the room, uh, and that's a much larger number, but these are still specialist beds. And then around that is side rooms which are not specialist or don't have the right equipment. What you would do in an emergency is essentially you'd go out from the centre. If you had an HCID that was expanding in numbers, at a certain point, you then move into what's called cohorting, where you take over an entire ward, and we did this during COVID, and you say everyone on this ward is going to, ha is going to have this disease, and no one who isn't, hasn't got this disease goes on to this ward. So there is a kind of, there's a mechanism for scaling out. Each one of those it, is at a slightly lower level of expertise and at a slightly lower level of uh, protection, potentially. Uh, maybe the first two are very high, high levels of expertise. But in all of those cases, you always have to see there's an opportunity to sc scale. And this is one of the things we've come back to repeatedly. You have to have plans to scale and you have to, have to work out how you're going to do it. That We're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid, Ms. Munro. We've got an awful lot to get through this afternoon. My lady, yes. I, I think, in fact, Sir Christopher has answered my last question about scaling out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much, my lady. Thank you, Sir Christopher. My lady, that concludes the evidence of uh, Sir Christopher. Would you? Thank you very much indeed, Sir Christopher. Extremely grateful for all your help. I was astonished and sorry to hear about the abuse of you and uh, uh, other colleagues. It's wrong for so many reasons but I do know how distressing it can be. So I hope that people will think twice, but of course they never do, do they, before you, uh, committing themselves to distressing acts unnecessarily. There's so many different ways to express different opinions. Why do we have to have personal abuse? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. My lady, may I call Sir Patrick Valance, please? Thank you. May I invite you to take the oath, please? I do solemnly, sincerely and truly... I do solemnly, sincerely and truly... Declare and affirm... Declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give... Shall be the truth... Shall be the truth... The whole truth... The whole truth... And nothing but the truth... And nothing truth. but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Patrick. Um, and thank you for all of the assistance that you've so far given to this inquiry and for agreeing to come and give evidence today. Uh, I know that um, you will be called to give evidence later on as well, and you know, as we have made clear, the um, permutations and the limits of the evidence that, that we're going to ask you to give today. Our time scale uh, runs back 10 years from the onset of the pandemic. And so I'm not going to ask you uh, about decisions that were taken during the course of the outbreak. Please speak up, please speak slowly, <laughs> and speak into the microphone so that the stenographer uh, can uh, hear you for the transcript. I'm going to begin by setting out uh, your qualifications and career history so far as it's relevant to this inquiry. You trained as a medical doctor and practiced as a general physician in the NHS in various hospitals in London, and you undertook research in cardiovascular disease, first at St George's Hospital Medical School and later at University College London, where you were appointed first as a senior lecturer and then professor of clinical pharmacology and medicine in 1995. You led the Division of Medicine at UCL from 2002 to 2006, 
Uh, and during your time, you were a consultant physician at the UCL hospitals. From 2006 until, until 2018, you worked for GlaxoSmithKline, initially as Global Head of Drug Discovery, and from 2012 as Global Head of Research and Development, where you oversaw the discovery and development of many medicines, including antibiotics, anti-HIV drugs, cancer treatments, and drugs for asthma. You are an elected fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, the Academy of Medical Sciences and the Royal Society, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. And from April of 2018 until March of this year, you held the post of Government Chief Scientific Advisor. And it's really, Sir Patrick, in that role that uh, we want your assistance at this stage in the inquiry. One of the benefits of giving evidence after Sir Mark Walport and the last witness, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, is that a lot of the explanatory evidence of, of your role as Government Chief Scientific Advisor and indeed explanatory evidence of some of the scientific advisory groups has already been received by my lady. But I would like to touch upon some common features of uh, the evidence that both of those witnesses have recently given. In terms of your role as Government Chief Scientific Advisor, can you tell us please, Sir Patrick, what you feel you brought to the role? Any changes that you made, improvements that were brought to bear during your time uh, in that role? And also tell us how you saw your role fitting in with the departmental scientific advisors and whether or not that part of the system is something that could be improved. Well, thank you very much. And um, I'm very grateful to be given the opportunity to contribute to this inquiry, which is obviously important for the future resilience of the country. Um, when I came to the role, I took advice before I came to it from a number of people. And I came to the conclusion that getting the science system in government truly embedded as part of government in an everyday sense was important. In other words, it shouldn't be something that sits off to one side that you just turn to when you think you've got a specific scientific problem. But it should be that science actually is embedded in everyday thinking and policy making. And therefore, having high quality science advice systems would be a crucial part of that. And part of that links to the need for every department to have a chief scientific advisor. Yes. Those advisors sit in departments. They need to be part of the everyday activity and the policy and operational discussions taking place in those departments so that they can bring in science and science advice to areas which perhaps a policymaker who's not from a scientific background wouldn't even think that science, technology, innovation or engineering might have a part to play. So one of the things that I set out to do was to look at the science capability across government and improve that system uh, at the uh, initial suggestion in a discussion I had with Sir Jeremy Haywood, who was then the Cabinet Secretary. And that uh, project was undertaken with the Treasury uh, and it was called um, uh, Science Capability Review, uh, or Realising Our Ambition Through Science. And the idea was to try and get more structure into the system so that we moved away from individual scientists being able to contribute if somebody happened to ask them to one where actually there was an established process and system to allow advice to be given on a regular basis. And so I think part of my approach came from the fact that I had run a very big organisation across the world and therefore worried about things like making these things systematic. And you brought that into force in November of 2019, didn't you? Yes, that was when the report was published. Right. And um, on a, I suppose, a connected um, issue would be the danger of, um, and, and this is relevant, I think, not only to the um, scientific advisors within departments, but also members of some of the scientific advisory groups, which we're going to come on to in a moment, that the danger of people moving positions and losing 
the experience and the knowledge from those positions. How do you say that the best way is to capture that and to, and to maintain that level of knowledge within the roles? It is a very big problem in government, people moving around and experience and knowledge being lost. And ensuring that you have proper departmental structural systems for institutional knowledge management is important and to make sure that institutional memory can be captured. So one of the things that we spent quite a lot of time on is trying to make sure that that institutional memory is in place, that there are mechanisms that don't rely on particular individuals yes. in order for this to happen. And as a an example, um, which may be a trivial example, but it's an important one, I think, is um, things like papers. It's one thing to have a paper that has a date when it was created. It's quite a different one to say, actually, I have a paper which it says when this paper has to be reviewed. Right. And I think that's really, really important that you have dates by which you say, this must have been reviewed by whatever, otherwise it's no longer a valid document. So I think there are process things like that which need to be in place in order to ensure institutional memory and continuity. We'll come on to it in a moment, but you will be aware of the evidence given this morning by Sir Chris Whitty about the United Kingdom influenza pandemic preparedness strategy from 2011, which was not given any sort of refresh or review um, in, the, in the time that um, passed between its implementation and the pandemic hitting. And the fact that in uh, Sir Chris Whitty's view, it, it didn't need a refresh, it needed an overhaul. But perhaps if, if that document had had within it um, a, a date by which it had to be properly and fundamentally reviewed, then, then that might have happened. Well, it seems to me that is good practice, to, if you like, have a sell-by date on these things yes. by which you must have looked at it and you, and, and you can't just roll it over. You have to have taken an action to have looked at it and say, I agree this is still extant or no, this needs to be changed. Thank you. One of the issues we discussed with Sir Mark Walport yesterday was the important difference between scientific advice, policy advice, and political decision making, and the fact that the, the role of a government chief scientific advisor is not to provide policy advice or to make decisions, but to give the scientific advice that is requested. Is there an important distinction between those three aspects of the roles? Oh, very important. And I, I don't think it's just to give the science advice that's been requested. It's also the science advice that needs to be given. Because if you just wait to be asked, it again goes back to the paradigm that assumes that the people asking know what the <laughs> science advice needs to be. So I think um, science advice is to pull evidence together. And by the way, evidence, of course, changes. The whole nature of science is that it is continuously changing and updating itself, and it is self-correcting. So one of the very important differences between um, what happens in science, where scientists actually quite like it when they discover that something they thought was true before isn't true, uh, it, um, or isn't exactly as they thought it was, that is an exciting thing. That, of course, is not universally liked in other parts of the world. It's often seen as a U-turn. <laughs> and, and or in so, other professions. I was just thinking about the legal profession. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't comment on that. <laughs> but, um, uh, so I think science advice is about bringing the evidence together. And, and I've laid out four things that I think are important. Yes. Is the evidence base adequate? And if not, what are you going to do about it? The second is, um, has the evidence base and your advice been understood including the uncertainties associated with it and what might change those uncertainties. That's a very important part of this because those uncertainties will change. The third, and I think this is often misunderstood, um, particularly outside government, is has the advice, is the evidence been presented in a way that's relevant to policy? Because as a scientist, you might often be very excited by your latest discovery. It doesn't mean it's relevant to policy. So you have to frame things in a way that is sensible and usable by policymakers. And the fourth, which I think is often forgotten, is can the science be used to monitor the effects of any policy choice? Uh, the policy choice is not the end of the process. It should then be monitored to see whether it's having the effect that you thought it might have.
One issue that Sir Mark raised yesterday in his evidence, and he described it as a, as a two-way street, is the fact that traditionally, perhaps, or, or historically, uh, there has not been as much um, um, interaction is, is, is perhaps not, not the best word to use, but there hasn't been an appetite on behalf of the scientists to raise matters which uh, have not been requested by the gov government department. So there's been a, a reactive rather than a proactive involvement um, on behalf of the scientific advisory groups. Do you recognise that? And if that is a problem, how do we going forwards ensure that the scientists are, are confident enough to, to raise things off their own bat? Well, I read some of the witness statements from some of the committees. Yes. Um, these are all Department of Health committees, and it's worth remembering that the GCSA role goes across every department and every area of science. So it's not, it just so happens I'm a doctor. It's not that the GCSA role is a medical one or indeed has any particular focus on DHSC. But I read those comments and I saw that in some of the committees they were in fully response mode, yes. according to the witness statements. I don't think that's correct. I, I completely concur with what Chris said. And actually, if you look at the um, code of practice for science advisory committees, which is a document that we submitted, it says clearly that it should be a mix of response mode, i.e. things that the department wishes to know, and things that the experts wish to say or wish to look at. Um, and I think that is important. And it's one of the reasons why if we turn to the chief scientific advisors, or indeed the GCSA role, they are fixed term, relatively short, so three plus two for a chief scientific advisor, five uh, uh, for a GCSA. Um, and they come from outside government, because you're bringing an outside in perspective, and it's not a sort of long-term career plan to be part of it, so you don't have the same sorts of pressures as a, a, and, and career um, requirements and decisions that a civil servant might normally have, and I think that is important because it, it is about challenge as well as as well as support and uh, information provi provision. Thank you. Staying for a moment on the topic of improvements, you tell, told us in your witness statement, uh, paragraph forty nine, that that you desired a high level of transparency in terms of, in particular, the workings of SAGE. And tell us, please, Sir Patrick, why you think that's important and how we can ensure that that, that is something that's taken forwards. Well, I believe that science advice in government, particularly reports, I don't mean every single discussion that's taken place, but scientific reports and outputs should be made public. And I think that's beneficial for everybody. It's beneficial for policymakers, actually. It's often not seen as that, but it is beneficial because it means the evidence base on which a policy is going to be formed is there for scrutiny, is there for comment, is there for challenge, and actually is often there for people to say, OK, I get that now. I can see why you've made that policy choice, given the evidence that you have. So I think the science advice should be public by default. There will be times when ministers need a reasonable length of time to consider it as they're formulating policy. That is a reasonable and fair uh, thing. But I think, in principle, the science advice, unless it's national security related, should become public. And um, I think one of the things we learned early during the pandemic, uh, prior to the pandemic, the um, minutes and output from SAGE only were published at the end of the process of SAGE activation. And quite early on, I was keen to try and get the papers out uh, as soon as we could. It took longer than it should have done for that to happen. And, and that, that is, uh, I think, a regret, and one that, uh, if you have the processes sorted out in advance should not be a problem in the future. In other words, you should get those papers out as quickly as you can. And it's part of normal scientific practice, and, and it's the way in which science progresses, which is for other people to look at it and say, ah, you might have gotten that a bit wrong, or that may be a little bit different. Well, what needs to happen then in order for, in order for going forward the, um, the, the well, is, is, it, is it a change of policy, or is it a change of thinking, or, or is it the fact that somebody simply needs to, to, to write down a, a series of rules which are followed 
in the event of another pandemic? What, what needs to change? Uh, two things. And, and, and uh, the first is the rules need to be laid out, and that's been done. And I that think that, has been that done. principle of um, the SAGE papers uh, will be published as soon as possible, uh, particularly the minutes. The papers are a bit more complicated because they come from academics and others who have control over those. So, so putting a timeline on that's a bit more difficult. And you, what you don't want to do, in my opinion, is to say everything you give us is going to be in the public da domain in 24 hours because they then won't give you anything until it's 100% complete and that yes. would be a, that would, that understandably would be a uh, so i think that's one thing and the second uh, is um the government office for science needed to have a process for getting papers out onto the website properly um searchable and constructed and that's that's been sorted out so i think both problems actually i see no reason why this can't be the norm going forward thank you except in national security situations. yes of course where, where different um, factors yes. apply Please could we have on screen the SAGE checkpoint review, which is at 62443. And if we go to page four, thank you, and could we highlight paragraph 22? First of all, Sir Patrick, can you explain to us what the SAGE checkpoint review is? Um, this was the initial a review that I asked for in early 2020, May 2020, yes. from uh, um, Sir Adrian Smith to come in and speak to a number of people in SAGE and other parts of government to try and find out what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, and how we might change it as we were going along, recognising that we were in for a long haul on this and we wanted to get um, as much information and feedback as we could. Thank you. We can see here science versus operational questions. Uh, across policy customers and SAGE participants, there was consensus that the line between science advice and advice on operational issues had sometimes become blurred. This led to SAGE sometimes being asked to advise on matters that were more operational in scope, for example, in relation to environmental transmission and the science behind mitigating risks. Now, I, I don't want to ask you uh, about what took place during the course of the pandemic, but, but just for, to, to ask you to explain whether, in your view, there is a problem about uh, scientists being drawn into providing advice outside of their level of expertise, and if there is, how we can plan so that that doesn't happen in the future. So, so some scientists in government are there to provide operational science advice, and that's particularly true in the public sector research establishments, and it would be true, for example, in what was Public Health England scientists. They are there to provide operational science um, advice and indeed to operationalise science. So that is entirely appropriate. Uh, I think what's important, though, is where, there, it, where it is advice. So it's either from a chief scientific advisor or from SAGE or from other committees that the evidence and the advice is separated from the policy conclusions, which must be up to those who have to formulate policy to put in place. Um, there's a bit about training and understanding that needs to take place in that, and there's also a bit about the um, recipient of that, because there were several occasions when people would want science advice on things that were simply not possible to give that science advice on because they were too granular, too specific, too detailed. And I think, I think that's a process of learning. Um, it got better, actually, during the pandemic, and I don't want to stray too much into what happened, but there was, there was one thing that was important, which was an educational process of those commissioning science to try and help them understand what were appropriate science questions to ask and which ones just were not going to be answerable. All right, thank you. You can take that down, please. In terms of be being better prepared, um, planning for both those risks which we are able to anticipate and those which we're not able to anticipate, but having in place good systems, flexible systems that are, are able to, to cope with the unexpected. You talk at paragraph 20, 46 in your witness statement of something called rules of the road. What do you mean by that and, and how can that help? Well, the, the rules of the road concept came up during the production of the 100-day mission, um, which was a G7 project. And that was about 
trying to get um, vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics in play within 100 days of identifying a potential pandemic threat being declared. Um, and I'll come back to that perhaps later. But, but, but the point here is that we said, well, there are some things that you don't need to wait and find out what the infection is or what the problem is before you can establish what you're going to need to do. So, for example, in the 100-day mission, it was on things like sharing samples across borders. It was about sharing data without having to go and renegotiate at the beginning. It was about rapid finance mechanisms to allow things to be done quickly. These things should swing into action immediately without having to worry about going through permissions and processes and devise things in the heat of the pandemic. So the rules of the road concept is to identify the generic issues that you know are going to be there. They might be legal, they might be ethical, they might be political, they might be social, and just say, can we please clear those so that we can activate them immediately without having to then redesign it or negotiate in the middle of a pandemic? Right. I know that um, my lady has given provisional permission for bereaved families for justice to, to ask questions on the issues of data and the topics of, of how, how that might be improved going forwards. But in terms of data collection and data usage, it is, is, is the, rule, the rule of the road that, that certainly there can be uh, procedures put in place now yes. that, that are capable of being adapted to, to lots of different situations when they arrive. Yes, um, and I've argued, and um, I think it remains important, that for every risk on the uh, National Security Risk Register, uh, we should, government should go through and ask, what are the data that you know you're going to need because it's going to give you information? Who owns those data? Or in other words, where do they sit in the organisations? How might those flow somewhere in the state of an emergency and where do they flow, how do you make them interoperable and who's going to analyse them? And those questions are simple questions that can actually be looked at in advance and will throw up, I think, blocks that we know exist and can be unblocked during non-emergency times. And it's very true for pandemics and it's equally true for other national risks as well, I believe. Thank you. What is your view of the interaction between your role and that of the scientific advisors within the devolved administrations? Is it historically a good relationship? Is it a close relationship? Can it be, in your opinion, improved at all? Uh, well, I have a very good relationship with the uh, chief scientific uh, advisors um, in Scotland and Wales and increasingly now in Northern Ireland where they've now got somebody who's at least standing in for that role. And I work with the permanent secretaries uh, of the devolved administrations to make sure that they know that they do need to have a government chief scientific advisor and have been on the appointments panels for those uh, those roles. Um, the system obviously a bit different in the devolved administrations in that unlike for the um, UK government where we've got a chief scientific advisor in every department that's not the case in the devolved administrations but each apart from Northern Ireland at the moment does have a overall government chief scientific advisor uh, and that person is the one that I interact with most uh, for obvious reasons, because they have a, a job which covers the government more broadly in, in the devolved administrations. And, and I meet with them, or met with them, I should say, I'm no longer opposed, met with them on a regular basis, as, as I did with departmental CSAs. And also, we agreed it was useful to have a regular meeting of just the devolved and me, so we could talk about things that were specific to devolved administrations that we might pick up together as a group. And I think that's, that's what, that worked pretty well, actually, in terms of day-to-day uh, -day non-emergency situation for uh, interacting with the you know, chief advisors. And I suppose one of the benefits of that is that when something like the pandemic hits, you have already forged relationships with those individuals, and there is a, a level of trust amongst you, which were you, were you not um, 
were you not um, it, concentrating on, on, on making sure that there was joined up thinking between all of the, all of the roles, then that relationship wouldn't be there. Uh, personal relationships are always important in these things, and that was a, a crucial one to, to, to um, get right. Um, and they also, and I, I, the thing I really like about the way that CSA Network has evolved is that subgroups spontaneously form. So they formed to say, actually, we now know we, we as a group of three or four need to go away and do a piece of work. And that's what's happened with the devolved administration uh, chief scientific advisors. Well, they've done that and formed a group. I think there's a specific question, and I know it's come up in some of the witness statements, about not the overall government chief scientific advisers, but the individual departmental uh, chief scientific advisers in the devolved administrations, particularly in health. And I have to say, um, one of the, uh, one of the um, unexpected consequences of getting a very functioning uh, CSA network going is that everyone wants to join it. And not everybody can, because it will become overwhelmed. And the reason that we've stuck with um, a single government chief scientific advisor from each of the devolved administrations is, A, they are the people who then can connect their own CSAs in, in, in those nations, uh, and, and B, it allows for, for example, the health CSAs from the four nations to join up as a group, and I believe they've now done that. They've joined up as a group. I think it would be inappropriate to start having all of those people in the overall scientific network, otherwise um, it's going to become very skewed by health. And the topics we discussed ranged from uh, cyber security to uh, climate to biodiversity to marine uh, um, laws and so on. So, I mean, there are all sorts of areas which is it's far away from pandemics and, and health. Thank you. Before we move away to deal with the role of the Government Chief Scientific Advisor in relation to the National Risk Assessment. I just want to ask you on a, about a final matter which um, I know uh, you have a certain level of passion about, and that's the prospect of an academic centre for, for, for pandemic preparedness. Why do you think that that is a good idea? Well, I think it's very, very important that we have a thriving research base, and, and, uh, and, and so Chris mentioned that in his evidence. And there's something about bringing together a critical mass of people who are concerned with the same overall problem of pandemic, which I think is going to provide the challenge and the independence and the foresight into the system. So I'm an enthusiastic proponent of the idea of creating a centre for pandemic preparedness. There are many different models that people are looking at. Uh, personally, I would favour something that was a sort of hub and spoke model where you had somewhere where there was a physical base, but then you had many other universities involved. And that is a place where many different disciplines could then come together. And actually, that is a place where I think things like economics could also be considered along, alongside epidemiology and other areas, because it would begin to provide uh, an insight into how you might think about the sort of difficult trade-offs that occur there. So I think um, concentrating on properly funded, well-structured pandemic preparedness centre would be an advantageous thing for the UK and would be an important part of how you think about introducing really informed, integrated challenge into the system. Would that also have the capacity to, to soak up behavioural science, something along along those lines. And as a, as a connected question, do you think that behavioural science demands a place on a full-time advisory board? Uh, because we know uh, from the evidence of uh, Sir Mark Walport yesterday that Spy B was stood up for the pandemic but has since been stood down again. Uh a few, a few things on this. First of all, um, uh, the, any centre for pandemic preparedness shouldn't just soak up behavioural science. Behaviour and social science should be an absolutely integral part of it. And that's the whole point. It should be a multidisciplinary thing. It's n not one where I think everyone is spending 100% of their time working on pandemics. And that's the beauty of it. It would allow an academic who's a specialist in one thing to say, I want 10% of my time to be spent in this. And in doing so, you would create a critical mass. So I think it's fundamental. Uh, I think it's worth noting that I think every exercise that's referred to in the documents had a behavioural scientist present at it, so there's yes. been quite good representation. Spy B, which was set up, I believe, initially, as the name suggests, for pandemic influenza behavioural science, was 
set up by DHSC and stood down, and we reactivated it quickly during COVID. Um, I'm not sure SPY B is necessarily what you'd have for ongoing behavioural uh, uh, science input to other things. And we recently, um, within the last year, set up a behavioural and social science for emergencies group headed by one of the CSAs, who is a social scientist, Jennifer Rubin, uh, with the idea that that group would look across national emergencies and ask what is the social science evidence base that's likely to be required in different emergencies? How could you commission research to try and get that sorted out and what needs to be done both inside and outside government to try and get that right. So I, I strongly support the emergence of that group. Thank you. Ms. Black, I think we, if that's convenient, I yes, think... Yes, of course. I think um, Very getting good. signals. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll break then for... We're back until... Oh, we'll be back at five plus three, please. Thank you Sorry to break off. All rise.
Yes, Mr. President. Thank you, my lady. Sir Patrick, what is the role of the Government Chief Scientific Advisor in relation to the creation of the National Risk Assessment, please? So the, the National uh, Risk Assessment is done department by department. So there's a lead government department for each of the areas. And therefore, the construction of the content is done <coughs> in, in inside a department and the challenge process for the specific risk is done inside the department. The role of the Government Chief Scientific Advisor is to look across at the methodology and ask are there some anomalies or things that need to be changed in order to get the appropriate consistency across or indeed other areas where we think that there's a need for different types of um, approaches uh, given different types of risks. So maybe as an example, my obviously my first experience of, of one of these was soon after I arrived, and most of it was in train by the time I arrived. Um, but at the end of it, having pulled together the CSAs to say, are you all involved in what's going on in your departments? Because they should be. Not all of them were. So I had to sort of make sure that they knew what was going on and they were actually linking in their, inside the department with the resilience teams. Um, and then to pull together the CSAs to say, when we look across, are there things that we're now pulling up as... Sorry. Sorry, Sir Patrick, That's please good. continue. Are, are there things that we're pulling up as, as um, anomalies or difficulties? So I think after the 2019 um, uh, uh, risk assessment, I wrote to um, the um, Civil Contingency Secretariat and said there are a few things that we picked up. One of them was reasonable worst case scenarios, which we said there doesn't seem to be a clear, consistent way of doing this across departments. And I think what was needed was more of a sort of workshopping approach in departments to really stress test what they were putting forward as their reasonable worst case scenarios. Is, sec I'm sorry. sorry to interrupt you. Is that the correspondence that you had with Catherine Hammond? Yes, yes, who was head of the CCS. Yes, yes thank yes. you very much. Sorry, sorry. please continue. Uh, the second was around interdependencies and concurrent risks, where we thought that looking at everything completely separately doesn't allow you to look at that properly. Uh, a third area was that uh, uh, we felt that there ought to be a way of not only looking at expert challenge in a departmental sense, but then to look at expert challenge across the whole thing, and that might require external and, and different types of groups to do that. So we suggested that that could happen and the um, CSA network could help provide names and, and support that, that, uh, that process. And the final thing was that I felt that ministers needed to really understand what risks it was that they were living with, you know, what, what was it that they were actually agreeing to when they did this? Now, the process for actually approving the uh, uh, National Security Risk Assessment is through the National Security Council, and the National Security Council then goes to ministers, and ministers sign it off. Um, and so that's really the role of the GCSA, is that sort of methodological look across to make sure that there are improvements. And that led, that, that feedback led to the commissioning of the Royal Academy of Engineering to produce what I think is a very good report, which outlines um, some areas that could definitely be improved on. Yes. And um, just pausing and, and dealing with the report, uh, that was commissioned uh, in January of 2021. Yes. And um, within that report is a recommendation that a spectrum of scenarios are considered. We'll come to that in a moment. But, but just remaining with the 2019 national risk assessment uh, the inquiry has already heard evidence and and looked at the assessment as it related to pandemic influenza and the reasonable worst case scenario uh, involved up to 800,000 deaths my lady um, a very eagle-eyed member of the um, public uh, has been in contact with the inquiry to say that when I was examining the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, earlier this week, I referred to 800 deaths rather than 800,000 deaths. So can I please make it clear that uh, it was 800,000 deaths? Thankfully, I don't think it misled Mr Cameron. But uh, It didn't mislead me either. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so Chris Whitty earlier today was asked about the potential problem with the reasonable worst case scenario system in that uh, it, it 
encourages uh, people to look at um, the situation once that reasonable worst case scenario has happened and ignores the prior stage of prevention. Do you acknowledge that problem? And if it is a problem, what's the solution? Um, I'm not sure. Well, I absolutely acknowledge that that's a reality, that yes. there is less attention paid on that than should be. I don't know whether it's the reasonable worst case scenario that makes that happen or not. I, I just can't comment on that. But I do think, and that was in my letter to Catherine, and as they went to the um, foundation of why the Academy of Engineering was asked to, to look at this, that scenarios are important and looking at different approaches to the real world, uh, reasonable worst case scenario is quite an important thing because if you don't have consistency, and it's worth reflecting that, of course, the uh, risk assessment process has a mixture of likelihood and impact, yes. which I think is problematic because you then multiply those two things to end up in a position. And um, the reason I think that's difficult is people then associate funding with where you end up on that. How so? Well, because the higher your joint score, the easier it is to use that as a lever to try and ask Treasury, therefore you need more funding. And that may not be an appropriate way to view this at all. And so I think impact is incredibly important, and I fully endorse the um, suggestion of the Academy of Engineering that impact is the thing that should be focused on. It's worth knowing the likelihood, but in the end, events are binary. They either happen or they don't happen. Yeah. You, you will remember the evidence of Sir Mark Walport earlier this week, who talked, I, I think, of the, uh, and also Sir Oliver Letwin, who spoke of the Black Swan event, that incident that is, is not particularly likely, but when it happens, it is catastrophic, and that, that those risks shouldn't be missed. I think that's right. I mean, what you then do about those risks and how much effort and money you want to put on it is a ministerial decision. Yeah. And it's important in that context, actually, that a lot of this, and I say this in my statement, there's some analogies with preparing for pandemic and other risks, but I'll stick with pandemics, to the question of whether you want an army or not. You need an army in a country and you don't turn around after 20 years and say, what a waste of money that was, we haven't had a war. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing, you know, which are the risks you want to make sure that you are properly enabled to deal with. And I agree with the point that uh, Sir Chris made, this is about capabilities, it's not about trying to end up with highly specific responses in the back pocket already for every single eventuality, that's not possible. But there are generic capabilities which are important across the piece. And he spoke also of flexible capabilities backed up by resources so that, if necessary, scaling up is capable of, of, of happening at, a, at short notice. I think scaling up is really, really important. And I want to uh, raise a couple of points which I don't think have been raised. One is that industry is really important. And so one of the resilience features for a country is which industries you've got that will enable you to do it. So we were fortunate in some areas, such as vaccines and pharmaceuticals, that we've got a big sector that was able to contribute to the scaling up. I mean, making a vaccine isn't just what you do in the laboratory. It's the ability to turn it into millions and millions of doses. Uh, we did not have a diagnostics industry of any scale in the UK, which made scaling up of diagnostics much more difficult. And um, Germany has a big diagnostics industry and did very well on that. So I think as part of resilience planning, it's quite important to look at the um, question of industrial base in the country as well and ask what needs to be done to make sure that the industrial base is in the position and is properly linked into the processes and the relevant organisations. In terms of, of vaccines then, using that by way of an example, um, Dame Kate Bingham has expressed her concern that uh, it, it, since the pandemic has slowed down and, and we've come out of the emergency phase, if I can use that expression, uh, the vaccines task force has been stood down. Do you think that that is a problem? Do you think that there should be an ongoing capability in terms of vaccine production? And, and if so, is that simply a, a political matter or, or is that something which science can help with? Well, I started the Vaccines Task Force and brought Kate in for a very specific reason, which is we had a very clear need to get things done in a very direct way, and she did it brilliantly. Um, but that 
that need was obviously not the same as the need now. Yes. So I don't think the model that we set up for the vaccines task force in 2020 is one that you necessarily need now. But is there a need for a focus on vaccines for resilience? Absolutely. So at the beginning of 2020, when we started looking at vaccines in January 2020, it was obvious that the industrial vaccine base in the UK had pretty much gone. Not the, There was still research, but the industrial base. And I don't think that was an active decision. It was what I'll call benign neglect with a very significant consequence. And so that had to be reactivated quickly as a part of that. I think um, the, con the focus on vaccines then needs to be embedded in what you do in everyday practice. And this is part of the 100-day mission principle. Don't dream that you can have a vaccine factory sitting there waiting for a pandemic. It's going to be staffed by people who don't know how to make vaccines. You need everyday activities that you can then scale quickly. And that, I think, is a part of resilience that needs to be really thought through very carefully. What are the everyday things? And so for diagnostics, if I take that as an example, the more the NHS use routine near patient rapid diagnostics, the more you have an industry, the more you're able to scale that for pandemic preparedness. Is it a political decision to ask, well, does the country want the insurance of had it, having a standing capability in terms of the strong scientific advice that Sir Chris Whitty spoke of being uh, incredibly good by international standards, in terms of having a, a, a scalable uh, vaccine yeah. uh, development in terms of, of other types of medical procedures and, and interventions that might be required in the event of a pandemic. I, is that insurance policy something, in your view, Sir Patrick, that, that really needs to be grappled with at a political level? Uh, yes, it's a political question, and, and it's an important one that also links to behaviours and culture, which I think... Uh, Sir Oliver Letwin touched on. Um, if, if I give a very specific example, when we set up the vaccines task force, it was very, very possible, even likely, that it would fail. And at the end of it, of course, it was a great success, and the National Audit Office wrote a report saying what a great success it was. If it had failed, the National Audit Office, I suspect, would have written a report saying what an outrageous waste of public money the whole thing was. And yet both things were totally possible. And so there is an inherent re reluctance to spend money in things which then might fail and look like a disastrous misuse of public money. So I think we need to be much more explicit about why spending public money is important for certain things, even if that then turns out not to be what's needed or used. In fact, it's picked up in the Hein report yes. um, in relation to the 2009 Thank you. pandemic as well. I think it follows from the evidence that you've given to the inquiry today that you would also agree with Sir Chris Whitty on this topic, that although it's important to have up-to-date and relevant documents such as the uh, influenza pandemic preparedness strategy um, and perhaps even have a a strategy along the same lines for emerging infectious diseases, documentation only takes you so far. And what has been set out by both of you about the flexible capabilities in, in practical aspects of preparedness is, is really where the importance lies. Very, very important. And um, I think Whitehall loves a report on a letter. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's about moving from that to a practical, what's the plan to actually do something about this, which is incredibly important, requires ministerial oversight and drive to make things happen, and very often requires very clear single point accountability, otherwise things get diffuse and don't happen. Yeah, thank you. Finally, um, I'd just like to ask you about the importance of identifying those with health inequalities in the planning and preparation for 
pandemics and the like. Um, how can that best be done, um, given that, as Sir Chris Whitty explained earlier today, one has to perhaps consider the causal pathway of a pandemic to identify who it's heading for yeah. most forcefully. I mean, there is a terrible, terrible truth, and um, it's something that we all need to reflect on, which is that all pandemics feed off inequality and drive inequality. I mean, that's the way they behave, and that is a tragedy that needs to be understood and is relevant, of course, to the many people who suffered during, uh, during COVID, that needs to be built into the thinking, the thought process, right at the outset. Of course, the issues of inequality are very broad and highly political across all sorts of areas, but the fact is it, does, it is what drives um, problems in, in, in pandemics, and therefore one needs to be extremely aware of that at the beginning. And one of the things when I look back at the uh, science advice, we, we did pick up on it, but I would like it to be embedded right from day one. It needs to be one of those questions on the first stage. You know, what are the issues around inequality that you should be thinking about now? In terms of science advice, others need to think about it in terms of operational planning. And it's relevant also to your question about behavioral science. I mean, one of the big questions is around communication, engagement with marginalized communities. And, um, that needs to be thought about in advance. I hope it's one of the things that the Behavioural and Social Science Group for Emergencies will be thinking about now as they think about uh, what research and other things can be put in place now that could help inform people. Thank you, Sir Patrick. My lady, as I have already indicated, provisional permission has been given to COVID bereaved families for justice to ask questions on the issue of data. May that be done, please? Certainly. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, m'lady. Uh, good afternoon, Sir, pa uh, Sir Patrick. I ask questions on behalf of COVID bereaved families for justice, which represents families across the UK. Um, as has already been prefigured, I want to ask you a few questions, if I may, about data. And I think I can take it shortly because you've already touched on this in your evidence. Um, Sir Chris Whitty described the importance of data in this context uh, this afternoon, and I, I take it that you would agree with his characterization of the importance of data. I can completely. see that you're nodding, yes, yes, Patrick. Yes, I mean completely, and it's in my, my statement it is. how crucial it is. Um, would you agree that the importance, that importance that we've just agreed on, um, in, of the data in pandemic response was something that was well known in the scientific community prior to COVID-19's emergence? Yeah, I don't think you would have found anybody who said data is not going to be relevant yes. to, to any, any response. So I think, yes, data is important. I think it's well understood across government that data are important for decision making. Yeah. Um, now, we understand from your statement, and again, um, Sir Chris Whitty touched on this, that issues with data led to significant problems in the early stages of the pandemic, didn't they? There was a paucity of data, which meant, and I say this in my statement, that on many occasions it meant that um, you were flying more blind than you would wish to. And those are questions um, for another module. But the fundamental point is that being able to gather basic data, such as how many people are in hospital, yeah. how many people are in intensive care, that was necessary, wasn't it, to understand the spread of the disease and to evaluate which individuals might be most at risk from the disease. Would you agree with that? Yes. Now, and just one other thing, if I may, I think the... the, the um, ONS survey that we got in place was another way of doing that, and it would be very, very important to get those things set up early. Yes, and I think you say in your statement that systems were put in place during the course of the response to the pandemic, but some of those had to be started from scratch, yeah. I think is the phrase that you use, and that's clearly um, not the situation that anyone would, would wish for. Would, would that be right? Correct. Um, now, you've told us this afternoon, uh, Sir Patrick, about the simple questions that, that, in your view, need to be asked about data. So just to, to recap, they are, what are the data we need? Who owns them? How can they be collected? How can they be shared? Are the systems for doing that sharing interoperable? So do they speak to one another? And who's going to analyze the data? Have I summarized those yes. accurately? Thank you. Now, could we describe that, those collection of questions, as a data strategy? 
very high level. I'm sure there are data experts who would want to add much more to that, but I think in principle those are the components. Yeah. And as you've said, those are areas, each, each of those questions should be considered and resolved in advance of an emergency. Yes. And that strategy, as I've called it, perhaps you wouldn't, but those collection of questions, that consideration of the importance of data, wasn't in place before COVID-19 to address a pandemic, was it? I don't, I don't think it, it can have been because th that was not uh, how it worked. And so I don't think the practicalities. So it's interesting because I think if you'd ask people, is that what you need before the pandemic? Everyone would have said yes, and I'm sure that's fine. The reality was it wasn't fine and there weren't systems that allowed that to happen. So practically, operationally, that was not in place. And it should have been, shouldn't it, Sir Patrick, given what was known about the importance of data in this context? Well, I think it should have been for all sorts of reasons, including it's very important for running healthcare systems and so on. So I think in general, it was an important set. I think some of the interoperability with other data sets, perhaps it wasn't so obvious that that needed to be in place at the beginning. Um, and perhaps there wasn't a driving need to have that in, the, in place at the beginning. But I think the basic bits, yes, you would expect that to be in place. The core fundamental bits of health yes. data those should have been in place yes. beforehand. Um, and just finally on this, Sir Patrick, if I may, you told us this afternoon, I think, that you've argued that these questions should be addressed for each risk on the National Risk Register. Is that right? Yes, I, I suggested to be practical that, that, that they should take the top 10 or 15 and do it there to make sure that we knew how to do it and then work through the rest. Yeah, and, and can you um, tell us what action was taken in respect of of the argument that you made um, prior to you leaving your position? Uh, well, I know, I know it's been understood and, and, and that people accept that this is what needs to be done. There is now something called the National Situation Centre has been put in place in central government, which is a big data centre to be able to analyse data and input data from many different sources. And there are data scientists in that group as well. So that is a very, very good start to this. And I also know that the uh, Chief Statistician, Ian Diamond, and I spoke about this a lot. And uh, he lo is looking at which data systems and flows can be used to get this right. So I think there is action against it in terms of a capability level. I don't think it's gone down to risk by risk yet. Yes, thank you, Sir Patrick. Thank you, Milady. Thank you very much. That completes uh, Sir Patrick Balance's evidence. Thank you very much indeed, Sir Patrick. You've been extremely helpful, as indeed was your obviously close colleague, Sir Chris Whitty. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. My lady, I'm being asked to invite you to take a five-minute break whilst we arrange things for the next witness, please. Certainly. I'll be back in five minutes. Thank you. All rise. <laughs>
My lady, the next witness, and indeed this week's final witness, is Dr. Jim McMenamin. May he be sworn, please. I'm so sorry. I don't think you're meant to give evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try again. <laughs> After me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. McMenamin, thank you for the assistance that you've given to the inquiry so far. Uh, you've provided a witness statement, and I know that you are familiar with the corporate witness statement as well from Public Health Scotland, and thank you for coming to give your evidence to the inquiry today. Please keep your voice up, speak into the microphones so that the stenographer can hear you for the transcript. If you need a break at any time, just ask. I'm going to begin by setting out your... Um, career history so far as it's relevant to the inquiry. You are a medical doctor with a master's in public health and honorary clinical senior lecturer at the School of Health and Wellbeing at the University of Glasgow. You were appointed as a consultant epidemiologist to the Scottish Centre for Infection and Environmental Health in 2003. Uh, you were then interim clinical director and strategic lead for the respiratory viral team within HPS, and you are now the Head of Infection Service and the Strategic Incident Director for COVID-19 at Public Health Scotland. Is that all right? Thank you. And one extra thing, that um, I was the chair for the three years of the National Incident Management Team in Scotland. Thank you. For the, for the three years involving COVID-19? That's correct. Thank you very much. Well, it, it's your evidence prior to that that we're interested in today in Module 1. And I'm going to begin, if I may, by using you to set out the a history and structure of Scotland's public health bodies. As you tell us in your statement, Dr McMenamin, Public Health Scotland works to protect and improve the health of people in Scotland and to reduce health inequalities. It became a legal entity on the 7th of December of 2019 and came into operation on the 1st of April 2020. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But that means that in relation to the time to which this module relates, the national Le leadership for protecting the Scottish public from infectious diseases and environmental hazards was the remit of Health Protection Scotland or HPS which was part of the NHS National Services Scotland, is that right? Yes, that's correct. HPS led on preparing for high consequence infectious diseases, epidemics and pandemics, and National Services Scotland led on preparation for general civil emergencies and whole system civil emergencies, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. You explain in your witness statement that Public Health Scotland brought together three legacy bodies, Health Protection Scotland, Information Services Division and NHS Health Scotland. So taking those three bodies in turn, if we may, HPS can trace its history back to 1969 and the creation of the Communicable Diseases Scotland Unit, which was a specialist unit tasked with conducting surveillance of communicable infections. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And the Communicable Diseases Scotland Unit then evolved, absorbing and expanding its remit to include helping protect uh, the, the public from non-infectious environmental threats to health, and at one point, the unit was renamed the Scottish Centre for Infection and Environmental Health, and it then became Health Protection Scotland in 2005. That's a whistle-stop tour of the history of public health in Scotland. But Health Protection Scotland was responsible um, for providing health information together with the Information Services Division. And um, National Health Service Health Scotland was Scotland's National Health Improvement Agency. Um, we have additional information about this in the Public Health Scotland corporate statement, my lady, 
explaining that the work of National Health, uh, National Health Scotland focused on what could be done to improve uh, public health in Scotland and to reduce what was seen as unfair and avoidable health inequalities. And is that work very much still in progress? Certainly very much so. It's at the centre of everything that uh, our organisation, Public Health Scotland, has been set up to address. Thank you. Public Health Scotland was created through the programme of public health reform that began in 2015. Uh, with the Public Health Review and, as we've already made mention, was uh, delivered um, up to and including 2020 through the Public Health Reform Programme. Are you able, please, Dr McMenamin, to explain why it was concluded that Public Health Scotland ought to be created and was created when, when, when that happened? Thank you. Um, over time, there had certainly been a very significant number of infection challenges um, uh, and information challenges in the community. Um, from the perspective of inequalities, um, earlier in proceedings, we've had heard testimony from uh, experts on just what the impact has been of those inequalities. The purposeful bringing together of the three organisations was to try and put inequalities at the centre of everything that we do to improve healthy well-being in the population. And that that very um, purposeful attempt then was to bring together the relative strengths of each of those organisations to try and assist in that process. If you like, um, to have some synergy between each of those to make sure that nothing was falling between the stones. So do you see there being a, a benefit of having a single unified public health agency? Very much so. Yeah. What about the timing of it, Dr McManaman? Um, why was Public Health Scotland made operational in April of 2020, given, as we know, that that was really a, a month or two after the, the COVID-19 pandemic had hit? It's certainly unfortunate <laughs> timing. Um, but nonetheless, something which had been well scheduled and was very supported by um, all of the territorial NHS boards and the other boards in Scotland and by Scottish Government and also by um, COSLA, because this new organisation was to be um, one in which it was jointly sponsored by um, the chief officers of each of the um, local authorities and um, by Scottish Government. So this um, uh, signalled um, uh, uh, approach where we were going to be coming into being became um, part of the legal framework in December 2019. And then um, we came into being on that April wow. 2020. Um, that was a smooth, as was smooth as we could make it, transition where our NSS, National Services Scotland colleagues, assisted us all the way through um, and uh, as we became this new organisation rather than the hundreds or so people that we might have had at the start of uh, this to try and deal with things we now had access to more than a thousand personnel to be able to help us in dealing with that. So in terms of the timing of it, it was something that had been in the planning for several years. You mentioned COSLA, that's the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, isn't it? What was the rationale for uh, and the effect of Public Health Scotland's accountability to both national and local government? Well, this again was a, a, a new bit of innovative thinking where we were trying to um, ensure that no matter what we did, it was to enable the health of the population at a local level to be best assisted uh, within the combined efforts of the new organisation. Right, thank you. Some questions now about funding. Um, you tell us in your witness statement that Public Health Scotland's <coughs> opening budget and staffing levels were, in your view, not sufficient for the organisation to be able to deliver health protection in a response that was required when the pandemic hit. 
Um, is, is that, does that remain your view? And, and explain to us, please, Dr McMenamin, why you hold that view. Yes. Um, in this instance, the, the particular thrust that we had here was that um, we had to have a funding that was adequate but flexible. How do we make sure that any ring fencing that we have um, didn't get in the way of what we needed to do within the new organisation? Now, I understand that um, financial um, uh, rules and regulations are essential within our National Health Service organisation to make sure that we demonstrate value for money in yes. everything that we do. But nonetheless, it becomes important that we're able to have flexibility in how we can best uh, utilise that funding available to us. But there's one important caveat to that. Um, that for that funding, um, which was, uh, you, know, you will see from our statement submissions, was funding in a, uh, a pre-pandemic setting, uh, was something which uh, was felt to be adequate for a, a pandemic as we move into that, that flexibility um, that we then would like to have is something which becomes much, much um, more attractive to allow a speed of response. Yeah, thank you. May we have on screen, please, document 101052. This is a document that we can see from the bottom right-hand corner was created in December of 2006. And it's Health Protection Scotland's Health Protection Framework for the Response to an Influenza Pandemic in Scotland. We can see from the first two paragraphs that um, this is indeed a document uh, devoted to pandemic influenza rather than any other type of pandemic. Dr McMenamin, why did this framework focus only on influenza as opposed to any other type of pandemic? And, and how, if you can explain to us, how did that in any way hamper the situation? This document was produced before what has been called the, the swine um, flu pandemic of yes, 2009. Yes, 2009, yes. Um, it was, uh, at the time, what we could see was the likeliest issue to come and challenge us. So from that perspective, it was very deliberately focused on a response to pandemic influenza in which we on a UK basis, we're working collaboratively to deal with that. All right. Let's look, please, if we can, at page seven of this document. And we can see that the aims of the health protection framework is to provide a tactical framework for health protection response, to put the health protection framework for the response to an influenza pandemic in <coughs> Scotland in the context of the overarching national arrangements laid out in the UK Health Department's Influenza Pandemic Contingency Plan, the Health Protection Agency Pandemic Influenza Plan, and the HPS Emergency Response Plan. Just pausing there, this of course predated the United Kingdom Influenza Pandemic Strategy, which we know was created in 2011. And the inquiry has heard from several sources that uh, despite certainly best efforts um, it, it, at a time close to the pandemic hitting, it was never updated. Are you able to tell us whether this older document created as it was in 2006 was ever updated to uh, attempt to um, give more timely advice to Scotland on pandemic influenza. Thank you. Um, it was never updated, but the, the reason why that was never updated was that, as you've outlined, we then had a pandemic of swine influenza. There was a, a UK discussion about how we would best learn the lessons and, and adopt recommendations from uh, the learning lessons that we collectively had. That meant that a, a, there was a, a, a deliberate attempt to have a coordinated UK approach to how we deal with things. Right. And although at the time that we did ask um, our Scottish Government colleagues about whether they would like this to be revisited 
um, the clear indication that we had at the time was that we would be using a UK approach to deal with this. Right. So moving ahead from 2006, swine flu hits in 2009. Uh, the U UK government commissioned the Hine Review, uh, which indeed led to the uh, strategy being created in 2011. Once that was in place, did the UK strategy replace this older document or did they sit alongside each other? That's right, that it replaced right. um, things because we were then working to a UK approach that was coordinated. Thank you. Can we take that down, please, and replace it with document 147859, which is an interim report from the Health Protection Stocktake Working Group and we see that, that the date of that is July of, of 2011. Do you know, as a matter of fact, whether or not this came into force before or after the UK strategy? I'm not quite sure because of the relative dates of when things were produced. I can't All recall right. whether, but it's, um, it's, the, whether the reports were um, synchronous or not. This was a working group established to examine the arrangements put in place in 2005, which I think had led to the 2006 strategy that we've just looked at, and to ensure that they were still fit for purpose. Is that right? Yes. And this interim report contains a series of recommendations. Could we go to page 46, please? Thank you. We can move through this quite quickly, but the recommendations relate firstly to capacity and resilience, if we can scroll down please, uh, roles and responsibilities, priorities and outcomes, governance and consistency. Thank you. This was an interim report. The final report, which we can put up, please, at 147828. Thank you. Uh, and can we go to page 44, please? And we thank you very much. Um, sets out, in fact, if we can, can we go up to the previous page so that we can see what the columns? There we are. Um, on the left hand side, I think we have um, the recommendations set out, and then the next column along, going from left to right, we can see whether the recommendation has made it into the final report from the interim report. Um, at the bottom, at number 34, page 42, we can see interchange should be arranged between staff of HPS and NHS boards and other activities considered to strengthen relationships and engender mutual respect and to help soften existing boundaries. This should include a wide range of activities, including joint learning sessions, joint training and web-based initiatives. Now, if we move across, we, we only see that that, that recommendation uh, was in the interim report, but then on the, the right-hand column, we have these words, MHPN with the support of NHS boards and HPS. Can you explain to us, firstly, if, if you know, why this recommendation didn't make it into the final report and what is meant by, by, the, um, by the bodies in the final column? Okay, perhaps in reverse order. Okay. Um, the MHPN, the, I guess, here is a, a managed health protection network. What um, ultimately uh, came out of that was the Scottish Health Protection Network, an obligate network of stakeholders coming together who were uh, mutually working with each other, including local authorities, to ensure that uh, we had um, addressed all of the challenges presenting within health protection. So managed health protection network. Yeah. And, and that, th this tells us that uh, that organisation was working with the support of the NHS boards and HPS. So does that mean that be because 
those systems were already in place, that recommendation didn't need to be taken forward to the final report. Is that how it worked? Well, for, for many of these things, that we were taking them beyond right. that. Because, as I've just suggested, um, that local authorities were now to become part and parcel of what we were trying to do to make sure that local delivery was addressed. Thank you. Can we go to page 42, uh, 44, please? and highlight the entry under roles and responsibilities. Here we can see there is a need to improve communication between HPS and NHS boards. Interchange should be arranged between staff in both directions and other activities considered to strengthen relationships and engender mutual respect and to help soften existing boundaries. This should include a wide range of activities, including joint learning sessions, joint training and web-based initiatives. Um, and we can see on the right-hand side the assessment is that the uh, managed health protection network is, of course, designed to help achieve a sense of integration between all parts of a service and should therefore be expected to serve a function of improving relationships and communication. However, our recommendation on interchange and other activities should stand. So this is how it appears um, in, in the table. Is the impression being created, Dr. McMenamin, that there was a, a difficulty perceived in terms of relationships between these bodies? And, and if so, how was that manifesting itself? And, and, and what was the proposed solution in order to engender um, better relationships? I think that the principal thing here that we were trying to address was a levelling up. Right. To try and ensure that um, experience at a national level and, in, and at a local level was interchangeable, that we could then see um, and learn from each other. Um, the Scottish Health Protection Network um, began uh, to have that purpose by having that sharing of, uh, of learning and experience um, across the, all of the health protection functions within Scotland. And would you say that following on from this final report, things did begin to improve? I think that um, it's certainly true that they were much improved as a consequence of the success of the Scottish Health Protection Network. That's not to say there are not continuing issues that um, we have uh, uh, had further effort to try and overcome. All right. Thank you very much. We can take that down now. Concentrating for a moment on the wider programme of health protection reform in Scotland, you tell us in your witness statement that the creation of Public Health Scotland was indeed part of a wider programme of public health reform. And you go on to note that HPS colleagues, yourself included, advocated throughout the reform period for recognition of the importance of actions to protect the public from outbreaks of communicable disease and incidents involving non-communicable environmental hazards to public health. Why was HPS required to advocate in that way? Um, I can offer you two potential uh, answers to that. One which is a corporate one and perhaps one a personal one. Please do. So, so from a corporate perspective, I think that what was important here uh, was that we were trying to um, uh, ensure that there was um, health protection um, having its place at a table when the key objectives that uh, were then listed were not immediately ones that jumped out saying health protection was at the centre of things. Um, we had um, a, a further discussion on an ongoing basis about this and that health protection, we were assured, was at the centre of everything that we were doing. On a personal note, um, that I can see that, yes, that was uh, important that we continued to advocate for clinical and scientific <coughs> leadership um, for health protection um, being important because we were mindful of the importance of incidents, outbreaks and, regrettably, pandemics. All right, thank you. May we look briefly, please, at 102990, because moving forwards, thank you very much, this is the 2015 review of public health in Scotland. Um, it, it was, um, as we can see, strengthening the function and refocusing action for a healthier Scotland, it, it had as its um, basis. 
that, can you provide a summary of this document, please? We can see at the bottom that although it's, it's headed 2015, it was actually um, produced uh, finally in February of 2016. Yes. T tell us what this is about, please, Dr. McMenamin. So here, um, and coming back to our central um, rationale for what we were trying to do, um, it was important that we were trying to put health inequalities at the centre of everything that we were doing. You've heard um, already testimony from Bamber and Marma about the stalling in life expectancy as one indicator of the health of the population. This was then occurring um, against this backdrop where we were very aware of the need to try and come together to address those health inequalities and hopefully to then um, have an increase in the health the life expect about the involvement of public health in terms of laboratories. Yes, this is and it's important. I think here that there is a an important distinction that I have to offer about what um, you may have already heard in testimony about um, for the. Health Protection Agency yes. for Public Health England and then the UK um, Health Security Agency. In um, the laboratory services management was in a commissioning role only. Right. So our opportunity then to have um, a, a, a great uh, effort and discourse about that was certainly not something that was um, addressed in the main by this kind of document. What role did um, HPA... Right up until um, the end of the time period for which we are uh, discussing this pre-pandemic yes. period, our, our role was limited in the main to this commissioning role for the national... Um, laboratories that would be doing reference work. That's unlike the situation then where um, much of the routine um, work uh, might be offered through either a combination of um, UCS laboratories in England uh, and uh, the NHS service laboratories. Is it correct that the sponsors, the the Scottish Government and the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, or COSLA, were engaged in developing an annual um, operation plan for, for PHS. Yes, and the, the, the ongoing work which has developed following on from the uh, beginning of the pandemic and that we are currently involved in um, for um, some of the commissioning work going beyond that into um, what is the needs assessment that we have for laboratory services across all of Scotland. Thank you. I'd like to ask you now about the provision of expert advice to the Scottish and the UK government and the extent of HPS's involvement in scientific advisory groups such as NerveTag and SAGE. What was the, the role of the Scottish Public Health Service in the um, nerve tag advisory group, was was it a member to start off with? Um, so, n nerve tag, and I'm, I'm sure that you you've heard already quite a bit about this, um, is um, a, an an organisation which has been set up, which has uh, taken um, through um, a robust appointment process experts in individual areas. It just so happens that I was successful in application to that on a personal basis, right. rather than it being Public Health Scotland, which are represented at yes. that type of meeting. Right, OK. And were there other representatives from other devolved nations also present when, when you were there? At its inception, um, and it's changed over time, then it's certainly been important to have um, opportunity for other colleagues to be co-opted into that process and Professor um, Peter Horby in the most recent past then has been instrumental in trying to ensure that 
it dependent upon the setting that we're considering that there's an appropriate scientific representation um, across the whole of the country. Right. In terms of the subject matter that, that Nerve Tag considered during your um, time there, do you have a view as to whether or not that was more limited than it might have been? And if it was, were there other aspects that, that you think, as an organisation, as an advisory group, they would have benefited from including in, in, the, um, in the matters that they considered and discussed? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much struck um, by uh, both the testimony that I've, I've heard um, from witnesses uh, uh, here, but also from uh, looking at the, the witness statements that, that have been provided both by Wendy Barclay and by um, by Peter Horby. Yes. That, that, that they um, give a, a good account, I think, of that, that there is always this balance, a balance about we have set questions that we're trying to a, uh, address because um, the government of the day have key things that they would like us to address, but that the scientific um, curiosity of many of these individuals in the same room is extraordinary. Um, uh, that, they, that, that these experts um, are often bringing complex issues that they have noted um, would be important for the group to begin to consider and there's opportunity um, through that network to then encourage um, one or other of the administrations or um, the Department of Health to then put that um, down as a significant item for discussion at a next meeting. Yes. You may be aware of the evidence given earlier today by Sir Chris Whitty on this subject. He landed on an arbitrary percentage 80 of 80 20 yes but um but but that i think accords with with the evidence that you've just given that there needs yes. to be a, a two-way street which is another phrase um taken from some Abs Walport's evidence. I, I, absolutely I, I don't quite know what the percentage is <laughs> and that is an epidemiologist that, that you'll probably get a an hour um, discourse from me about that but <laughs> yes i agree all right thank you very much we know from your witness statement that you also sat on SAGE, representing HPS as it then was, PHS as it now is. And um, tell us about your time there, please, Dr McMenamin, and, and whether you think that there are improvements that can be made in terms of the way that that uh, advisory group conducts itself. Um, my... Uh time uh, as uh, an observer uh, in all of the proceedings, um, getting to as many of those as I possibly could, along with many colleagues, was it was an extraordinary examination um, forensically at times of the, the key challenges presented of the day. Um, those individuals who were coming, who were uh, giving of their time freely, um, were truly incredible, and I have nothing but respect for everything that uh, they were able to say and do. Um, uh, my role um, there was limited, perhaps, if there were key things that um, we were providing, either as validation of observations that were occurring um, south of the border or in the other administrations, or, for the first time, being able to present um, interesting observations, particularly in the early days of the estimation of vaccine effectiveness, where we were able to say, using the EVE collaboration data that had been set up as a consequence of the hibernation projects um, set up after the swine flu pandemic, right. um, uh, uh, important observations there about early insight to what we might see in the population and early light um, of uh, a, a path potentially um, out of the uh, lockdowns and social restrictions that we had in the population. And whilst you were present at SAGE meetings, uh, were you convinced that there were mechanisms in place to promote challenge and to ensure a range of views, as we've just um, discussed, is, is so important in these advisory groups? Yeah, I think that um, all of the SAGE meetings were ably uh, led by um, either of uh, uh, Sir, Sir Patrick Valens or Chris Whitty or yeah. others who might be deputising of the day. Um, there were great opportunities for colleagues to be able to um, say 
um, without reservation what their own views were about particular challenges um, and to challenge mindset about um, any key things that were being discussed. Thank you. A different topic now. I'd like to ask you about HPS's status as a Category 2 responder under the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004. Um, what is your view of it being assessed as a Category 2 responder? Do you think there is merit in its categorisation being raised to a Category 1 responder? Or, or do you foresee difficulties if that were to happen? And if I may, if I can present two um, things. Yes, yeah, please. Both a corporate thing and a personal thing. From a corporate perspective, I can see that it is really important that we have um, a Category 1 response labelling because we are at the heart of the assessment of risk. We are um, important in all of that. Um, on a personal basis, I, 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 I can't understand why um, our organisation um, should not uh, be designated as, as a Category 1 on the basis of the um, guidance and response function that we have in supporting major incidents and pandemics. Becoming a Category 1 responder carries with it additional responsibilities and duties. Do you consider, Dr McMenamin, that Public Health Scotland is, is able to provide those and is the right organisation dealing with public health to be able to carry out those additional duties and responsibilities? Absolutely, with mm -hmm. one caveat, and that is obviously resource. <laughs> Funding, yeah. All right, thank you. Finally, I'd like to um, take you through a series of um, scenario testing exercises and, and um, to ask your expert opinion on, on what you think worked well and, and what might be capable of being improved. Um, there are some names here that the inquiry has not yet heard about because they are Scottish specific. Uh, one back in uh, April of 2009, an exercise called Called Craw. What was that all about, Dr McMenamin? <laughs> <laughs> so as you might imagine, it would be something to do with a crow or yeah. uh, the like. So, um, of course, the uh, uh, avian influenza and influenza immediately yes. spring to mind. And, of course, that's exactly what it was about. All right. Um, you note in your statement that the plans for this exercise were, in fact, overtaken by the swine flu pandemic. And although it was, it was well planned, the, the tabletop, tabletop exercise itself did not take place. Was it rescheduled? Beg your pardon. The, the, the was it was it rescheduled? Which sorry? Called Craw. Yeah, I think that it, it was not rescheduled, um, particularly because we suddenly had a natural event that was presenting not too long afterwards um, with the swine influenza um, pandemic. So my understanding, at least of uh, of my own recollection or of others of the time, was that we had a natural challenge yes. that immediately followed. Do you know whether any of the preparations for the exercise were able to be drawn upon uh, when swine flu hit? Um, certainly, uh, much of the constant evolution of thinking that we had um, in any of our preparedness uh, was to address um, many aspects of what were to be covered um, by that kind of exercise, in particular for the avian influenza database uh, that we had that ultimately became what you will, I'm sure, hear more about um, in response to Module 2 with the first few 100s uh, uh, approach that we had for uh, gathering clear, concise information about the first cases of any new infection. Also known as FF100, isn't yes. it? Um, the next exercise on my list is Castle Rock in September of 2010. I'm not going to ask you about the details of that because it simulated a chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear incident, so far from the, the topic of this yes. inquiry. But, but I would like to ask you about the fact that this was an exercise led by both the UK and Scottish governments. Do you have a view as to how well 
um, a, a, a joint operation such as that, uh, and we're, we're going to come in a moment to talk about exercise Cygnus, but how, how something created by, um, by uh, governments in, in, in two separate nations are, are, are capable of providing um, benefit to, to both of those nations. Is that something that you would promote? Or, or do you think that the Scottish-only exercises, designed and focused as they were on Scotland, um, are, are, are better in the long run? Well, I think the, the truth of that is that the answer is you need both. Yeah. We need to have um, that local exercise capability to see what we can focus on. What, what sometimes is forgotten is um, every exercise can only focus on a few key things. Um, it can't necessarily uh, encompass everything. So having that opportunity to focus on that local um, issue becomes really important, particularly for the local authorities who might be uh, dealing with that. Whereas on a, on a UK basis, having an understanding about um, how to relate to each of those constituent parts of the UK and um, where we will get key information from becomes important. And one important thing that I should say about that is that um, for some aspects of environmental public health, um, Scotland um, is entirely reliant through a service level agreement with uh, the Health Protection Agency, Public Health England, and the UK Health Security Agency. And that's reserved issues like yes. um, radionuclear uh, issues, etc. Thank you. Silver Swan took place over the latter part of 2015, and its aim was to assess the preparedness and response of Scotland's local and national arrangements for an influenza pandemic over a prolonged period. This, I'm going to describe it as a rather successful exercise, um, focused on four areas, health and social care, excess deaths, business continuity and overall strategic coordination nationally. But of importance, you say, in your witness statement was what came out of that exercise concerning PPE. Tell us about that, please, Dr McManaman. So inevitably, um, there are um, key things that come out of every exercise. You, you hope that you're challenging perceptions, identifying issues in the expectation that you'll be able to address them in subsequent work. Um, part of our organisation at the time uh, within Health Protection Scotland was our um, antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infection team. Um, that's shorthanded to RHI. Um, it's with um, much uh, personal regret and corporately um, uh, regret that we saw this part of our organisation didn't come with us into Public Health Scotland. It remained within uh, National Services Scotland. It was, however, uh, the uh, most painless uh, divorce, I'm sure, of, uh, of, 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 of medical and nursing teams because we continued and continue to this day to work very closely with our RHI colleagues who were an essential part of the pandemic response. The reason why I'm, I'm focusing on that as background first is that it's this RHI team who have become pivotal to us in addressing everything to do with personal protection equipment. And although I can offer um, my own understanding um, of that from um, I'm representing Public Health Scotland and HPS of the time, um, it, it might well be that a, a separate um, issue that you may wish to consider asking of our RHI colleagues who remain within National Services Scotland. The question that you asked though was, what happened? Um, the key thing that we can see is that there are issues of interpreting um, what the, the safe use of personal protection equipment should be within the NHS. That becomes really important for us to make sure that we can um, have um, all of that sharing with the infection prevention and control teams in any of our hospital or second, uh, secondary care settings, but also across the NHS estate. Um, that key learning was something that continues um, uh, to be part of our discussions on an ongoing basis, including what we do for high consequence 
infectious disease and that our RI colleagues are right um, up the, the middle of all of that. The fact that the provision of PPE and the stockpiling of it and, and, the, and the use of it across the whole um, of the um, health system in Scotland had been raised in the latter part of 2015 um, must have meant that by the time operation exercise Cygnus um, falling into that trap again sorry exercise Cygnus uh, took part in October of 2016 that that uh, knowledge and, and those concerns could be carried forwards because you, I think, personally uh, attended Exercise Cygnus, did you not, on behalf of um, HPS. And we know that the aim of that exercise was to assess preparedness and response across the whole of the United Kingdom for pandemic influenza. Um, did you, in fact, take to Exercise Cygnus the information and the knowledge that, that you had gained through Silver Swan? Yes, indeed. Not, not just me, but many of my colleagues who were joining on behalf of either Health Protection Scotland or other um, parts of the NHS in Scotland. And how did you, how did you find... At exercise Cygnus. It was a huge <coughs> undertaking, wasn't it? This inquiry has heard that it involved 950 participants. Um, as, as a matter of interest, did you travel over to, da, or down to England in order to attend, or were you attending remotely from, from Scotland? How did it work? My, my memory of that was a, attending remotely, I think, for that right. particular one. And we know it took place over the course of two days and that the initial scenario was that the influenza pandemic had, had just hit and then the, the, the further day was um, some, some time beyond that once um, systems had, had, had been up and running for some time. Um, when you came away from Exercise Cygnus, did you believe that public health in Scotland was well prepared for the outbreak of a pandemic influenza, or did you appreciate that there were significant uh, lessons that had been learned and preparations that needed to be put into place in order uh, to, to, to get that level of preparation to an acceptable degree? I think the latter. Um, despite any great um, work by uh, any number of very industrious colleagues working in the background, my own team included, but yes, there continued to be very significant things that we needed to continue to work on. What actions did Public Health Scotland take away from Cygnus? And are you able to tell us whether or not, but by using a couple of examples, those were carried through and indeed were in place by the time the pandemic hit? Um, earlier I spoke about the, the Scottish Health Protection Network being used as an important vehicle to make sure that we and all of our colleagues then were sharing um, our own experience and learning. I think that the key thing that we were then coming back to was um, for personal protection equipment, as you've already yes. highlighted, it is a, an essential bit of what we needed to do. And our RI colleagues in particular were very, very focused on this. But also some of our thinking then about high consequence infectious disease and what we should be doing about that. You may or may not know that um, Scotland does not have a high consequence infectious disease unit. We um, rely then on, um, through service level agreements, um, the, 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 the excellent service that's offered through um, colleagues uh, in England, where we then have to transfer patients that might require that high consequence infectious disease management. That's part of our reignited discussion that we're having uh, north of the border currently about what should be the case in the, the, the new world that we are living in, where we are learning as much as we can about pandemic preparedness for the future. And do you believe either personally or corporately that, that Scotland should have its own HCID system? Um, I think certainly at the moment, corporately, that we um, wish to see what the the balance is, um, we understand that, of course, um, there should be value for money in everything that we do. Is there a good enough case that in this instance that there should be? My own personal perspective is that 
um, I'll be influenced by um, our infectious disease clinicians. You spoke to just one of those earlier in the day with uh, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, um, south of the border. But it will be important that we have um, a, a view expressed by all of those colleagues about whether it would be important to have that capability locally or whether we continue to rely on the, um, the, the, the good grace of our UK colleagues to support us. Thank you, Dr McMenamin. Would you excuse my back, please, my lady? Thank you. My lady, I can confirm there were no Rule 10 um, requests in relation to this witness, and so that completes Dr McMenamin's evidence. Just one question from me, Doctor. Um, you mentioned in your witness statement that you were doing a lessons learned report. It would be available by April 2023. Was it available by... April 2023? My lady, uh, my apologies. Uh, my understanding is that it was near um, completion, but it's not yet completed. Right. I can certainly um, ask my colleagues in the background and try and make that available as soon as possible. That would be really helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. I'm sorry we've kept you so long. I hope it hasn't um, mucked up your arrangements for returning home. Not at all. Um, very well. We'll finish there today, and we. I am sitting again at 1030 on Monday. Thank you, my lady. Thank you all very much indeed. All rise.